17 years ago, on almost this exact date, my world came crashing down. I was told that I'd be laid off from my dream job in the IT world just two short years after I pushed all my chips to the center of the table and relocated for it. And just days later, sure enough, my wife served me with divorce papers. Before I knew it, I had lost my job, my wife was gone, and my three-year-old daughter left with her. I was alone in an empty house with a big mortgage. No family, no furniture even. There was only one option left. Get creative. That's what we're talking about on today's show. For me, the result was this. Nowadays, I live the dream. I do what I want, when I want, with the woman of my dreams by my side, and seeking to make the world a better place rather than merely making big companies richer. Listen, gentlemen, it took disaster for me to wake up to the reality of what was possible if only I would think out of the box. If this show today inspires you in any way, let it be to wake you up to the opportunities and possibilities that would abound in your life if only you'd open the door. As a man who walks this talk right here and right now, my passion is to empower you to make the most of your one shot at life. Mountaintoppodcast.com is the place, and the first step is a free 25-minute call with me to motivate and inspire you to your own definition of self-actualized greatness. Enjoy this fun and thought-provoking episode with my new friend Jeff Lysowitz, gentlemen, and emerge ready to take strong, definitive action. Here we go. Live from the mist and shrouded mountaintop fortress that is X and Y Communications Headquarters, you're listening to the world famous Mountaintop Podcast. And now, here's your host, Scott McKay. Hey, all right. Welcome again, gentlemen, to yet another episode of the world famous Mountaintop Podcast. My name is Scott McKay at Scott McKay on Twitter and Parlor. Real Scott McKay on Instagram. You can find me on YouTube as Scott McKay. Mountaintoppodcast.com is always the website and the Mountaintop Summit on Facebook is always the Facebook group that you want to join to be with our group of men who are headed in the right direction, finding purpose, finding fun and adventure expanding their careers, and of course, expanding their circle of fine women in their lives. With me today is a new friend of mine. He's a lot of fun. He hails from Seattle, Washington. His name is Jeff Leisowitz. He's a creativity coach. So guess what we're going to talk about today, right? You don't have to be too creative to figure that out. We're going to talk about how you can go from being boring and not having a whole lot going on and thinking maybe, well, I don't know what can I do to mix it up a little? I really don't have anything to offer to flipping all of those, you know, limiting beliefs. That's what they really are on their ear and really putting some fun into your life, putting some new ideas and some new actions into your life. And guess what? It'll make you more attractive to women too. So he's the author of not effing around the no bullshit guide for getting your creative dreams off the ground. Jeff Lysowitz. Welcome, man. Hey. Happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, if you're creative, of course you're going to be happy to be here. There's no <laughs> sense in wallowing around and shame and guilt and unhappiness if you're a creative person. I think of creativity as adding color to one's life, going from kind of black and white and grayscale to just exploding in energy and color and fun and vibrancy. Oh, absolutely. Is that how you think of it, too, or what's your spin on it? Yeah, I mean, creativity is, well, I think of it, it's not really a luxury item, right? There are things in this world that we have to do, right? We have to work, we have to, you know, socialize, family stuff, money, all those kinds of things. Sometimes people think of creativity as just you know, this extra thing that you might want to stick in there if you have time or you're kind of interested in some kind of way. But really, I believe creativity is a core part of our being. So not a luxury item. It's something that really fills us up, maybe not as much as, you know, food, right? You got to eat food. You got to go to work, those kinds of things. But creativity really is something that adds a huge dimension to our lives. Man, way to dive in head first. That's an excellent <laughs> take to start this whole thing off. I mean, yeah, I think you're absolutely dead accurate with that. I mean, you're right yeah. on. I think most people think, okay, creativity, that's something I'm going to do in my spare time. Right. You know, I work, I'm an accountant all day long. 
I wear boring clothes on the weekends or when I can go dress like a furry and do watercolor or something. You know, I mean, that's when I do the things that are different and creative. And yet, at the same time, not only is it completely plausible, I mean, it makes perfect sense what you're saying, that creativity should be something we inject into every aspect of our lives, whether we're at work or at play or in relationships, all of that. But it's not necessarily something that's weird either. It's not necessarily something that's off the charts and freakish and necessarily going to make people raise their eyebrows. It's simply what? Doing something differently than you did in the past, changing things up a little, not falling into the trap of the conventional and the rote and even the trite and banal, things you've always done just because you've always done them. That's really where the action is in creativity, right? Absolutely. It's, you know, creativity is really creative skills on one hand, you know, playing the guitar, being able to play a chord or to paint or something like that. But creativity itself, the core of what I believe creativity is, is simply connecting things in your mind or and in the world that are not obvious. Right. You take two different ideas and you put them together. And that is creative. You can do this in language. You can do this in, you know, music. You can do it in anything. So that's where the big business ideas come from. That's where, you know, fun games and things like that come. Everything really kind of comes from, uh, you know, starts from creativity. How can we put something new together to make something else? So that's why the world is always creative. Yeah. Creativity seems to rule the world. Anything we ever do to further mankind and our knowledge or our enjoyment of life or helping us improve our quality of life, all of that comes from someone who was creative. And I think it's a very interesting point that you just made, you know, perhaps indirectly. You were talking about people think of this as painting or playing guitar. A lot of times people think of creativity as being synonymous with art. Right. But it's not. You know, someone's an actor or an actress or an author or a songwriter. Oh, what a creative person. But there are people coding software. Absolutely. There are captains of industry who are, of course, incredibly creative. I mean, I've been on some airline flights before where the pilot was <clears throat> creative. So, I mean, <laughs> this can extend to all kinds of walks of life, can it, Jeff? <laughs> right. And you, you want, you know... Your creativity, you want it to be in some places, you know, driving that plane. Let's not be all that creative with it, right? But in talking to the customers or the travelers, yeah, why not be creative? Why not make it fun, make it interesting, make it different? It just lightens up life. It just makes life more interesting. Yeah, well, you know, that's not exactly what I was thinking, but anybody in the United States who's ever flown Southwest Airlines is well familiar with the fact that the flight attendants, I almost said the S word, you know, get in trouble for saying stewardess nowadays, right? Mm -hmm. The flight attendants are almost making an art form in and of itself to be creative in their in-flight presentations and, you know, giving the security detail at the beginning. So, yeah, right on. Almost anything you do that has always been done a certain way, assuming you have a little bit of wiggle room there. When you actually change it up and do something different, you're indeed being creative. And you know what I've noticed, Jeff, is people really actually appreciate that. They're glad you were creative. And I think what may hold some guys back, and this may be one of the baby steps to get us to a larger vision of creativity now that I'm thinking about it, is we're always afraid someone's going to be offended. If we do something even slightly different than what we did in the past, therefore, you know, we don't take that risk. Right. Absolutely. So one of the things that is really true for people is that we, we have this need to fit in, right? To not be cast out of the group, whether it's at work or socially or anything like this. So what that kind of does is makes a, a lowest common denominator in behavior and ideas. Okay. So if you always do the safe thing, the most uncreative, most repetitive thing in your life, you're less likely to be seen as weird or to be cast out of whatever group that might be. Right. But that never extends outward. That's always going towards the center, extending outward outside of the comfort zone. 
right, into new worlds of adventure and thought and ideas and creations of any kind. That's where the action is, right? You have to be willing at some level to put yourself at risk to be a little bit different, right? And this is where, you know, when you look at the great artists and musicians, they started out as weirdos. They didn't understand how or know or were capable of being in the middle of the group, right? Of normal, being normalized in that group. And then suddenly they become a rock star. It's like, whoa, this guy's great. This guy's cool. And then the, the group sort of moves towards that. So it's really fascinating. Yeah. You know, as you're talking, what's occurring to me is, well, take the example of the rock star you just mentioned. What separates the guys who become famous and eventually become wealthy and even great, Hall of Fame great, is not their musical talent usually, but rather their creativity. I mean, the London Underground is replete with people who are amazing musicians. But the difference is they didn't come up with any incredibly creative styles or write their own music or do anything that move the art forward. I mean, there's the word art again, right? But, you know, to illustrate the example I just gave, if someone's thinking to themselves, I'd like to write a song, I'd like to take a crack at that. And they listen to two albums of Led Zeppelin, right? <laughs> so they could write a rock song. It's amazing how much that song will sound like Led Zeppelin. And indeed, lots of people can cite all sorts of influences in their art, in their music, and or even any work that they do. All of us have mentors. All of us have examples. As the saying goes, there's no such thing as an original thought, right? But if you look at the people who are legendary, they changed the art form. They changed the game. They changed the narrative somewhat so that the creativity took center stage and really whatever talent they had, however much practice they put in to cultivate that talent, carried them. It carried the creativity. Would you say that's accurate? Oh, it's absolutely accurate. And in many cases, again, going back to my earlier point, it's simply putting together two different influences or two different elements. You know, many songwriters have said there are no original songs. You, you steal pieces of everything and you just put it together in your own way. When you think about like grunge music, there was heavy metal and there was punk. And then... Kurt Cobain and his, you know, all these guys in Seattle and all over the place put these things together and suddenly like, oh, that's a new thing. Boom, takes over the world. Well, I think that's a brilliant example because grunge really was the revival of a four man band. I mean, it was good old fashioned, bare bones, noisy rock and roll with a hint yeah. of obnoxiousness behind it. And everybody said to themselves at the time, oh, my gosh, this seems so new and fresh. <laughs> really, it was old as the hills. Right. You know what I mean? Right. You bring to mind a concept I'd love to run by you because I've seen this happen several times in very high profile ways, even lately. You're talking about taking two concepts that people haven't really juxtaposed before and putting them together. And I would love your opinion on how much groupthink has to do with that. In other words, okay. Someone very highly influential, a group of highly influential people has caused us to look through whatever it is we're looking through, through a certain lens, you know, defying creativity, saying, hey, you know what? You need to think and feel the way we do. Several amazing examples. Okay. First of all, country music. One of the guys I'm a fan of is Tyler Childers. And people are like, oh, my God, Tyler Childers is so amazing. Now, first of all, granted, I could listen to this guy sing the phone book because he's just incredibly talented. If you're not interested in this kind of music or think much of it, I would challenge you to listen to a couple of Tyler Childers' songs and see if you still think that way. He's basically the male Adele in terms of how he can just emote music. And if you're not an Adele fan, you know, so be it. But you got to give props to that chick that she can really – she can really bring the feels to a song like nobody else. That's what won her all the Grammy Awards. I mean, if you're a rock and roll guy or a blues guy, Stevie Ray Vaughan, you could just feel his guitar music because he felt it first. Well, what Tyler Childers is doing is not new at all. But the phenomenon that is Tyler Childers is he took old school Hank Williams 
country music. You know, like I'm drunk and I'm sick and my wife left me, you know, no more of this overproduced, let's get some mud on the tires and paint it on blue jeans country music. And he went back old school and started singing old Johnny Cash songs and old Hank Williams songs. But he talks about opioids and cocaine and mm. things that are happening in the year 2020, you know? Yeah. And yeah. people are like, my goodness, this is so raw and so amazing and so different and incredible. Well, it's old as the hills. As you guys are listening to this, if you're listening to it after it got released, we are in the middle of deciding, basically, what happened after our 2020 presidential election in the United States. Assuming Joe Biden is going to prevail, which is what it looks like right now, I can point to one moment that I think well, you know, it's pure conjecture, Jeff, but I think got him over the hump and got him extra votes where there weren't any before. During the first game of the World Series, the Biden campaign ran an ad that shocked the world and frankly scared the bejeebers out of Republicans. In a world where it was becoming derogatory to kind of scoff at the American flag in general, if you're on the left. They ran a commercial with flags waving, construction workers, pickup trucks, sunsets over the Wild West, and it was narrated by none other than Sam Elliott. You know, Sam Elliott, the Coors guy, the Dodge Ram guy, the dude, you know. And it was such a pattern interrupt because it was a Republican commercial. I mean, the feel of it, the texture of it, the tone of it. You know, we're going to get through this together, you know, and in the end, all that matters is we're Americans and we'll take it from there. You know, it was amazing. It was like, wait a minute, where did this commercial come from? Well, what happened is over the last four years, the Republican Party has become Trump's party and things changed. The tone changed, whether you like it or not, the tone changed. And what did the Democrats do? Something genius, something utterly so creative that it hit everybody upside the head. They took a Reagan era, a George Bush era vision of what the Republican Party looks like, and they appropriated it. They're like, hey, there's a vacuum here. With Donald Trump's Republican Party, there's nobody showing these images anymore. So they did it. <laughs> they took it up. And, you know, if you're the Republican Party, you're slapping your head going, why the hell didn't I do that? Well, because you weren't creative enough to figure out there was still a market for it. So someone else creative came and said, hey, you know what? Flags, pickup trucks, Sam Elliott, that has nothing to do with Republican policy. It has to do with being an American. We'll take it. If you don't want it, we'll take it. And it was so utterly creative. But then again, nothing was new there. You see what I mean? So... Tyler Childers' music, old as the hills, just everybody forgotten about it, and they brought it back up. That commercial for the Biden campaign, hey, old school Republican imagery, we'll take that too. And indeed, certain drinks come back into vogue, like, you know, people are drinking um, old fashions again, which, you know, we haven't heard about since, you know, the Mad Men era. People are doing all sorts of things, thinking they've discovered something incredibly new and cool, and really someone was creative enough to revive it. You see it in fashion. You see it in the culinary world, even the cinematic world, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, when you're coaching people to be creative, how do you get them from top dead center of doing everything the way they've always done, thinking something new is going to come from it? And get them to start thinking around, perhaps out of the box, to get them to come up with something new. Because I think the guys could really benefit from hearing your hearing your methodology on that. Sure. I mean, we start small and thinking about ways in which we're so repetitive, okay? So, for instance, driving to work or walking to work, you're almost certainly going to go the same way every single day. Right. So this is, you know, it saves time and you found the fastest route and all that. Okay. Great. But what if you go a different way? Right. What if you just walk around? Suddenly there's a little bit more adventure, more stimuli, more, you know, more difference in your reality. So start with something like that. We can do 
writing exercises. I've got this great one called the speed wrap where you write for 10 minutes. You cannot stop. Spelling doesn't count. Syntax, grammar, none of that stuff counts. But here's the real clincher. You can't make any sense. You can't finish a thought. And this will automatically, eventually, start to stir up creativity in your language center, in your brain. Right? So this might be something like, I'm talking on the Skype with Scott a lot, around the corner, been through the exit strategy, you know, it's like whatever, you just kind of keep it going. When you start to think creatively and take small creative actions, it essentially disrupts your patterns because being creative is sort of like a pattern disruptor, like you were talking about before. By definition. By definition. So if you're stuck in your ruts, as we all are in different ways, you know, by shaking that around, by stirring it up, by stepping out of that comfort zone a little bit, you are going to experience new things and thus have at least the access to start to put these elements together to create something different, to think something different, to do something different. Now, what did Willy Wonka famously say? A little nonsense now and then is cherished by the wisest men. <laughs> so I think a lot of guys are too cool and too suave and too important to waste their time and energy on this creativity stuff, not realizing it's the stuff of what makes life fun. Now, that brings to mind, is it feminine to be creative? And of course, I think we can quash that in all sorts of ways. Uh, you know, there are lots of things that aren't necessarily femininity that are very masculine, and we can come up with all kinds of new, cool, creative ways to go about it. Yeah. You're talking about uh, writing things down that don't make sense. And of course, you know, that's what made T.S. Eliot famous. <laughs> and similarly, what made somehow trying to produce a movie version of Cats a very bad idea. <laughs> right. right. Andrew Lloyd Webber there by way of T.S. Eliot. Yeah. And yet, this whole idea of having guys write down a bunch of jabberwocky just to get their creative juices flowing allows them to think out of the box and change that very habit. So the next time they're tempted to do things the way they've always been done because, hey, that's the way we do it around here they'll automatically start thinking in another direction and voila, you're already a little more creative than you were before, right? Exactly. And I'd like to circle back a little bit to what you're talking about, masculinity and femininity in creativity. What we're looking for in creativity is the balance between these elements. What's the essence of femininity? It's like receptivity, right? pulling in ideas in this case. But the masculine core is directed focus. So if you can pull in, if you can be receptive to ideas and to feel them and to expand on them, right, and then activate your masculine side more so that you can make a decision, act on it, step forward, then you are creating, that is like really the formula for creation. Okay, so you have to be receptive to new ideas, right? We've been talking about that. And then take action. So really what any artist or creator does is simply make decisions based on what they have received, meaning, you know, what they think about, what they feel, what they experience. You know, when you're writing a song or a book or something like this, you're making hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of decisions. And that's a very masculine principle. So when we get this balance and we learn to sort of work between these two, that's that's when we really can activate our creativity and step forward in the world. Well, I think that's very interesting because instead of thinking of creativity per se as either masculine or feminine, or even thinking of it as not gender specific at all, which is where I was going with it, it's really very creative to think why not just put it all in the same pot and see how it simmers up. And I think that's something a lot of guys would have to wrap their head around, especially if they're particularly macho guys and thinking, you know, this is all sissy stuff. But that comes back around full circle to the idea that creativity isn't simply about painting flowers and weeping over snowflakes. It's <laughs> anything. I mean, let me give you a couple of examples. First of all, I'm an NBA fan. Right now, you being from Seattle, you're probably an erstwhile NBA fan, <laughs> but uh, hopefully you guys get another team soon. I think that's in the works anyway. At least I hope it is. Last I heard it was. 
anytime it's crunch time, it's clutch time at the end of a game, often if the point guard is a really good, solid player, they'll pull out a play at the end of the game just out of nowhere. And many times you'll hear the play-by-play announcer go, they're two points down, there's 10 seconds on the clock, Chris Paul's going to have to create. And these guys become legendary and they become all-stars and someday Hall of Famers as playmakers, as guys who, when the chips were down, it's not even like they had to think and go, how can I be creative? Creativity became a habit, perhaps even an instinct coming from deep within their talent. They got to Malcolm Gladwell's point of unconscious competence in knowing how to create. And that is something that people are just in awe of. I mean, men, women, everybody, anybody who doesn't have that level of creativity on tap is thinking, man, this person, it isn't like they're sitting around going, oh, how can I be creative? And they spend the next year working on a, you know, a 12 foot long canvas, this massive magnum opus of whatever it is they're doing. But I mean, they're freaking Johnny on the spot with something creative. People who are really funny, stand-up comedians who don't need a script, who just are absolutely hilarious people, that's because their brain is always creating something different, something unique, something uh, out of the box. And so just about any area of human endeavor can have some creativity tied to it, right? Yeah, I like that. I really like the um, the stand-up comedian example. Because going back to the masculine and feminine parts, as a person, as a stand-up comedian goes around their life, lives their life, in a way, that feminine essence or that feminine idea is just them observing the world. Just observing the world is, you know, I would say feminine in a way, right? But once you get up there on that stage and the microphone's there, that's like all masculine. That's like all decision-making. They're riffing, you know... (laughs) riff after riff after riff those are all decisions so they're taking again both of those pieces together and creating on the spot which is always really impressive yeah that's really fascinating yeah and if you think about it on another level using the same set of examples we've just offered people who can think very quickly on their feet have cultivated the ability to create from practicing And when you think about that aspect of it, it sounds a little ironic, doesn't it? You're doing the same thing over and over in the name of figuring out how to be creative. But, you know, you start putting in the cycles, practicing your guitar, painting trees (laughs) over and over again until you get it right. Once you have the fundamentals down, once you have the basics down, then the creativity that you layer on top of it somehow seems even more meaningful. I mean, back to the basketball example, I'm a San Antonian, so we love Tim Duncan around here. And Tim Duncan's nickname, of course, was the Big Fundamental. He just did all the uncreative things right. So when it came time for him to go, oh, man, I better create at the end of this game here, he already had that basket of just rock-solid essentials to draw from, and then he was able to flex a little from there. And that's In many people's minds, the essence of greatness is I know how to do everything I'm supposed to do inside the box fantastically such that when I venture outside that box with creativity, it almost always enhances it rather than being detrimental. Absolutely. So going back to uh, another music example, Jimi Hendrix, if you know the history of Jimi Hendrix, he was like a session guy. He was playing just the basic stuff in any band he could get uh, a job with. He was just a good player. And then when he sort of went solo and went for it, he took all those basic or fundamental skills and, bam, exploded that. And again, when he put those two pieces together, you know, legendary, complete change in how the guitar was played. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, an interesting note there that just came to mind while you were talking is if you play Jimi Hendrix music circa 1967, 68, for a teenager today, they'll go... Well, what's so great about this guy? I know 5 million guys who can play the guitar like Jimi Hendrix does. Yeah, but he innovated it. He was the first guy ever who sounded like that. When people heard Jimi Hendrix in 1967, they were like, wow. I mean, you know, a Model T 
isn't all that great a car by modern standards. But, you know, when Henry Ford built an assembly line and started rolling those things off of it, it was amazing. So you always have to look at things in terms of historical context and look back and say, man, this person really was creative because not only was this stuff not going on, but over the years, again, ironically to people who are living, who are from this particular milieu, this particular time frame, look at the influence and how widespread it's been. And the fact that it's hard to recognize a true innovator's creativity years later serves as nothing more than a rather monolithic testament to that very creativity. I know that's <laughs> ironic, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's sort of what we, what we started off talking about, which is how people tend to go towards the center, right? So that they're not marginalized, but then they step out, you know, Jimi Hendrix steps out way back then. He's, he's completely different and you fast forward, you know, decades and oh yeah, everybody, you know, there's, there's plenty of guys who play like that. <laughs> right. So, it, you know, the, the, yeah, what's so special about that guy? Right. Right. And and now it's not special. But if you're first, it was it is special and made all the more special by how widely copied, adapted and evolved it became later. Absolutely. Yeah. Incredible. You know, what's another interesting concept tied to creativity, at least in my mind, I'm being creative here. Right. God help me. <laughs> um, I want to see what you have to think about this. Obviously, it's hard not to have the U.S. election on our minds, given the date this is being recorded. My wife said something so funny to me last night, and I believe she was absolutely right. At the very beginning of the show, you talked about how people do things the way they've always done. They get into the habit of doing it, and it doesn't even occur to them to change. And as it looks like that Donald Trump is not going to get another four years in office. Uh, you know, my wife and I were talking about how people are going to respond. I mean, will there be a Republican resistance and will there be never Bideners and will there be Biden derangement syndrome? And she said to me, you know, it's kind of like, you know, what I think is going to happen here is ultimately the people who really were so negative towards Trump and spent so much time on Twitter just hating on Trump. They're going to be a lot like a dog that caught the car they were chasing. They've gotten in this habit of doing this and feeling this and saying these things. And now all of a sudden, the object of that scorn is gone. What do they replace it with? <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, now the guy who's in the Oval Office is the guy I really want to be there. Well, that's no fun. That's almost conventional. That doesn't give me any outlet for what it is I'm so used to doing. Weird, isn't it? But I have a feeling that she was right. You know, what are these people going to do without Donald Trump when they've gotten into this habit of doing all these different things that have become so rote in their minds over four years? So that's kind of a almost a mirror image, Alice in Wonderlandish kind of way to look at it. But creativity can take weird turns, as can lack thereof, right? I mean, your job, if you've been doing your job for years and years and all of a sudden your cheese gets moved and you're fired, you have no choice. You have no choice in the matter. You now have to be creative or else you'll starve, right? What happens when people are pushed into creativity against their will? Uh, just what you said, they adapt. I mean, look at the pandemic. We, we've all had to sure. adapt in different ways. We've become creative you know, almost everyone because you have to, right? Yeah, nobody a, nobody asked for it, <laughs> but here we are. And I guess there's really no helping people through that. It's either sink or swim, or would you have certain strategies that guys could use? Well, I mean, the first thing I would say is you realize what has changed and what needs to happen. You know, you always want to know what your goal is, right? If you if you lost your job, the next question is, well, you know, get another job or create work, you know, something like that. So once you have that, you can start to create the plan and think through it and see what might be stopping you. And that's kind of where I come in as a coach. We are so often blocked by our own selves, whether consciously or unconsciously. You know, you get people who are like, I don't know how to do a Zoom call. I never did it before. Now everybody wants to Zoom. Well, guess what? Learn it. <laughs> it's not that tough. 
it's amazing how things that are incredibly intimidating to us because we've never done it before or we've never tried it before are easily solved by a five minute YouTube video. I mean, I fix things on my car. I fix things around the house that I was sure were going to be 10 times more difficult to accomplish than they really were. And I watched the YouTube video and it's like this revelation. Like, <laughs> that's well, it's, not so it's, hard. Yeah, it's fear of the unknown. And, yeah. you know, the unknown is always scary, whether it's, uh, you know, how to turn on your Zoom or, you know, the future of the planet. So what we need to do is have the courage to step out of our comfort zones. And that's another huge part of the whole creative piece. Sure. Stepping out of the comfort zone. And what happens when you do that, just like, you know, the Zoom or the YouTube videos, you step out there, you stand in that discomfort. Okay. It's a new thing for you. It's creative. It's different. It's uncomfortable. It's supposed to be. But if you stand there and you feel it and you just deal with it, the comfort zone will expand to you. So let's just take that Zoom call. I've never done a Zoom call. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. And you know, everybody wants to talk on Zoom. Okay. Great. You deal with it. You do it. You screw it up a little bit. You do it again. You stand there in that uncomfortableness. And the next million times, there's no discomfort. The comfort zone expands to you simply by having the courage to step out creatively from wherever you were and in whatever way you choose. Our tendency as human beings to wallow in our safe mode is utterly uncreative <laughs> and is boring. And that leads us to what is the elephant in the room in this entire presentation. And last week we mentioned a gentleman named uh, Randy Posh who had something he called the last lecture. He went around speaking about life and the future when he had been uh, diagnosed with terminal cancer. Uh, and I actually went and consumed some of his videos after recording that show. And he was just a delight. He had an amazing sense of humor even though he was dying and he didn't want to talk about his own dying or how it would affect the family. He simply wanted to give an uplifting message as his gift to this world upon leaving it. And what he said was when there's an elephant in the room, you better introduce it to everybody. Right. <laughs> and, you know, he was referring to his own imminent death and he acknowledged that before he went on to talk about something completely different. But the elephant in the room that we must introduce here to everybody is the idea that women love men who have exciting lives, who have something to bring to the table when they meet a woman that is unconventional and exciting and different and fun. And guys hear all the time, hey, you know, you better have an exciting life. You can't just keep doing the same thing you've always been doing. You can't be, quote unquote, set in your ways and expect to be interesting and attractive to women. So how does creativity intersect with that idea so we can get better women into our lives, Jeff? Sure. Well, you know, the first thing is you need to be interested in your own life. Like no woman is going to be interested in you if you're not interested in you. How about right? that? Go figure, right? <laughs> I mean, pretty basic, but it's true. So if you are bored with your life, somebody else is going to be bored with your life too. Right? <laughs> Just makes sense. It really does. Right? So – how to be creative with that. You know, you talk about adventure and excitement and that's certainly great. You know, if that's who you are and you, whatever that means to you, that's fine. But integrating creativity means anything from reading a book, a nonfiction book on a subject that you never learned about or know much about and actually having something to talk about like something interesting, like asking good questions, because that's really another huge aspect of creativity is curiosity, right? If you're curious about the world, you can explore the world and then express those sorts of ideas, right? So, geez, what are you interested in or what could you be interested in? Read about it, learn about it, do it, and then express, hey, I've never done X, Y, Z before. Try it and fail at it. Trying something and failing at it is way more interesting than not doing anything. Yeah, and yet our egos get in the way of us looking silly and foolish. And really, our egos are making us less attractive in that regard. Exactly. Fascinating. You know, we did a full show on curiosity, and I consider myself to be a very curious person. Listening to you talk and uh, describe how creativity 
and curiosity are linked, it occurred to me that curiosity is like the jet fuel that powers the action and the motion that is creativity. Absolutely. Yeah. How about that? Love it. His name is Jeff Lysowitz. He's a creativity coach from Seattle, Washington, and the author of Not Effing Around, the No Bullshit Guide for Getting Your Creative Dreams Off the Ground. It's a fantastic book, obviously, very creative and a lot of fun. And in order to get your hands on it, what you want to do is go to a special link that I've set up for you. And it is mountaintoppodcast.com front slash create. Okay. C-R-E-A-T-E. And there you'll be able to get a copy of Jeff's book. And I will also put it as I usually do. Well, I always do it right at the top of the queue on my Amazon influencer page, which you can reach by going to mountaintoppodcast.com front slash Amazon. Not effing around the no bullshit guide for getting your creative dreams off the ground. Jeffrey Lysowitz, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been a lot of fun. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. It's been great. Yeah. And guys, listen, you want to create something in your life? You want something to be there where there was nothing there before? I don't care whether that's your career, the adventures, having the right woman in your life, or maybe even just anything different than you've been doing before. Like I've said all along, the way to get off a top dead center is to take the bull by the horns, get control of your life and do something about it. Most men will wander around without ever asking for directions. And a lot of guys will die doing the same thing they've done their entire lives. When are you going to draw the line in the sand? Well, I'm here to help you with that. Go to mountaintoppodcast.com and sign up to talk to me for free for 25 minutes about all these things and anything else you have going on in your life that you would like to make better. We promise results here. We guarantee results. So talk to me for 25 minutes for free when you click the red button at the upper right-hand corner of the site, and uh, you'll find that I'm a regular guy just like you. I'm exactly who you expect me to be. I don't play a fictional character or anything like that. When you talk to me, it'll be me you'll be talking to. And while you're there, visit the fine folks over at Origin Maine. I've got my Origin bison boots and my Origin jeans on right now, and I'll tell you something. They're the best jeans and the best boots I've ever worn. Go to mountaintoppodcast.com front slash origin and use the code mountain 10 to get you some for yourself. I guarantee you'll love them as much as I do. While you're at mountaintoppodcast.com, you can also click on the link and visit my friend Lucas Rui over at Hero Soap. He's got gift boxes just in time for Christmas coming, and you just got to try his body wash. If you love the soap, you'll love the body wash just as much. He's got it in that masculine lavender scent. I know it doesn't sound masculine, but man, my wife just loves how it smells. And he's got one called the Pines, and you're thinking it smells like Christmas. Yeah, it's a little bit different. Just wait till you get a whiff of what that smells like. You're going to love it too. Go to mountaintoppodcast.com front slash hero soap and see what Lucas and the guys have over there for you. And you can also use Mountain 10 to get 10% off there too. And until I talk to you again real soon, this is Scott McKay from X and Y Communications in San Antonio, Texas. Be good out there. Mountaintop Podcast is produced by X and Y Communications. All rights reserved worldwide. Be sure to visit www.mountaintoppodcast.com for show notes. And while you're there, sign up for the free X and Y Communications newsletter for men. This is Ed Roy Odom speaking for the Mountaintop Podcast.